Ladies and gentlemen, hit subscribe to this channel right now. In a couple of seconds, you will hear from former President Donald Trump and also Justice Amy Coney Barrett. She, along with uh, Samuel Alito, Clarence Thomas, and I explain how Justice Thomas will give Trump, has already essentially given Trump a huge victory on presidential immunity, as has as have all the conservatives on the Supreme Court. By even looking at the case, they've essentially already gave him a partial victory on presidential immunity. Okay? They're looking at the case, which is what the special counsel did not want. We'll get to why Democrats and Smith did not want the Supreme Court, despite two lower courts siding with them, to look at the D.C. indictment. Because everything is falling apart. I told you, ladies and gentlemen, and hit subscribe in a couple of seconds. You will hear Justice Barrett, and you will understand exactly why she's almost certainly given Trump a huge victory on partial or complete presidential immunity pertaining to his speech. But I told you there would be a unanimous Supreme Court decision. I told you, ladies and gentlemen, long before any publication wrote that there would be a unanimous Supreme Court decision, I said there's going to be a 9-0 decision overturning Colorado. It was an unconstitutional ban, and the Supreme Court of this country, the highest court in the land, Shauna, thank you so very much. Shauna, God bless you. Thank you so much to the members and to the Super Chat. Thank you. If you want to support also my work uh, via uh, Patreon, ladies and gentlemen, that link will be below. Shauna, so kind of you. Thank you so, so very, very much. God bless you. Shauna Constant, thank you so much. But ladies and gentlemen, it's already taking place. They're going to give at least a 5-4 decision on presidential, partial or complete presidential immunity over his speech, in large part, and you'll hear Amy Coney Barrett right now, in large part because of what this Washington Post article uh, says. The 45-page indictment talks about his, uh, what was in Trump's head, okay? Um, they have to, con They have to convince the Supreme Court that Trump did not believe he was railroaded. That he that he, they have to convince the Supreme Court, which is why it'll at least be five four. You have Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, Alito, um, uh, Barrett. Okay, so at least five four. Roberts. Well, let's say Roberts sides. So you have Clarence Thomas. Amy Coney Barrett, Brett Kavanaugh, Neil Gorsuch, and Samuel Alito, it, at least you'll get a 5-4 that Trump is protected because he indeed believed what he was saying. The entire indictment, and you'll hear Amy Coney Barrett in one second talk about the originalist viewpoint, the Constitution will not allow just like they didn't allow Democrats in Colorado, the Constitution will not allow Democrats to be despots and authoritarians and totalitarians. Trump did not, categorically, objectively, did not commit a crime. Number one, because he truly believed that Democrats are corrupt, which anyone with a functioning brain cell believes that or understands that obvious reality. And two, he truly believed he was treated like Bernie Sanders. We'll leave it at that. Bernie Sanders in 2016, they completely, it was not fair or just or uh, neutral, fair or neutral. So Trump did not believe that he was treated in a fair manner. That's why they can't indict him. And the speech is protected under the First Amendment and also under the Constitution. He was commander in chief and he was also allowed under presidential immunity to perform a speech. Hit subscribe to this channel right now. This is a lead up to a huge monumental victory, even more important than the 9-0 complete and utter rebuke that Democrats faced in Colorado. The Supreme Court. Every justice, even the liberal justices, sided with Trump. Okay, good luck trying to make Trump a menace to democracy when the entire Supreme Court offers a rebuke 
a repudiation of the absurd Colorado ruling where liberal justices said Trump committed a rebellion and the Supreme Court said, no, he didn't. And you'd have to convict him first and you haven't done that. And you have no right to try to ban him, uh, you know, off off of a president out of a presidential contest. This is Amy Coney Barrett talking about why the 5-4, in my view, there's going to be a 5-4, could be 6-3, could be 7-2, that the uh, uh, Smith loses, the special counsel loses, because the Constitution allows Trump to contest, to give his viewpoint, regardless of whether or not the uh, deceptive fact-check uh, articles disagree with Trump. Hit subscribe right now. A little bit about Justice Scalia and what his absence from the court will mean, and then shift and talk in a broader brush about what's coming for the court and what the election will mean for the court. And I know I have a room that's mixed, some lawyers and some not, so if the lawyers will forgive me, I'll, I'm going to try to pitch it so that the non-lawyers um, can uh, follow along as well. Um, Justice Scalia's, it's hard to overstate the influence that he had on the court and the whole that will be gone um, with his passing. Um, yes, Justice Scalia was a conservative. And so, you know, it's often said he was on the conservative wing of the court. But it, um, I really dislike the use of that word. And the By the way, Amy Coney Barrett was a clerk for Justice Scalia, okay? She, along with the five other, so there are six conservatives, they're not going to look at the D.C. indictment and say that Trump can be imprisoned because he really was lying and he's not covered under a, he's not, he's not covered or he's not protected uh, because of a speech. Okay, Trump did not commit a crime, he performed a speech that preceded criminal activity that he had literally nothing to do with. Hit subscribe right now if you're new this context, and he would too, um, translated to say that he was a conservative doesn't refer to partisan politics. To say in the context of constitutional law that Justice Scalia was a conservative described his approach to the Constitution and his approach to the judicial role, not a party affiliation. Um, Justice Scalia's approach to interpretation of both the Constitution and statutes, and that's the grist for the mill for a federal judge is interpreting federal statutes and the Constitution, his approach very much emphasized the primacy of the text. His view was that, if you're talking about the Constitution as a text, that the Constitution means what it meant to those who ratified it. Um, as people would have, under, he interpreted the text as people would have understood that text at the time it was ratified. So for the original Constitution, um, we're looking at the late 18th century understandings. For the Civil Rights Amendments, we're looking at the post-Civil War Reconstruction period understandings. But his rationale for that was de democracy, that this is the enacted text. It went through the process of ratification or a constitutional amendment to become a law. And if we change the law now to comport with our current understandings or what we want it to mean, then it ceased to be the law that has democratic legitimacy. So he believed that change should come from the democratic process, that change from the Constitution should come through constitutional amendment, and statutory change should come from Congress or state legislatures. That the Constitution didn't call all the shots, that change and social change, the Constitution set a floor below which we can't go, but that above that floor, there's a lot of room for democracy for the people to add additional protections and to make changes. Um, so Justice Scalia resisted the notion that the Supreme Court should be in the business of imposing its views um, of social mores on the American people. He thought that things that the Constitution didn't declare off limits were up to the people to decide. Um, his view of this emphasis on text and the emphasis on textual meaning as it was understood at the time of its ratification in the context of the Constitution or um, statutory enactment in the context of legislation distinguish him from those we might characterize as the liberals on the court. And I give the same caveat here. We're not talking about partisan politics. We're talking about the word liberal capturing an approach to constitutional interpretation. 
And that approach, which um, Justice Breyer, Justice Stephen Breyer is a good example of it. Justice Scalia and Justice Breyer went out on the talking circuit and they often sparred about the approaches to constitutional interpretation. So Justice Breyer's approach is much more pragmatic. So he starts with the text, be it of a statute or a constitutional provision. He begins with the text, but as Justice Breyer describes it, the text is a starting point, but not an ending point. And sometimes it makes sense to push the text in a different direction in a way that makes sense to the judge, that the judge will think leads to a more sensible result. So that's kind of a nutshell version of the living constitution approach. And it stands in contradistinction to the originalism or textualism of Justice Scalia. Justice Scalia was an extraordinarily effective advocate for his approach to interpretation because he was very smart and had an outsized personality. Um, he really was brilliant. It was intimidating working for him. You know, when he called you in his office, you had to be prepared to just go to the mat and talk about whatever it was. And he was always five steps ahead of you. Um, so he had a, a massive intellect. But then he didn't express that intellect only to lawyers. It wasn't just in the United States reports in judicial opinions. He wrote books that were accessible to popular audiences. He went out and gave speeches. And so he made his ideas and his approach to the Constitution and his ideas about the judicial role accessible to non-lawyers. Um, he once remarked that the reason why he wrote dissents and separate opinions, concurrences, is because he wanted to get them in the case books. And he was a colorful writer. He was an excellent writer. And so case book authors would include his dissents and separate opinions because they were so engaging and so clear. And then that influenced law students who read them. So his influence on generations of law students has been great, and his influence on the public debate has been great. So the significance of his seat, it's, it's an empty seat on the court, and it has the potential to flip the balance on the court between these two camps of judges, judges who take a more expansive approach to the Constitution and judges who take a more textual approach to the Constitution. But the symbolic significance is that it's his seat. So he is the face, really, and uh, he is the face of this originalist, textualist, textualist approach to the Constitution. And so if President Obama had successfully, and I, I think at this point it's unlikely that President Obama will be the one to name the, the successor to Scalia's seat, but if Hillary Clinton or President Obama names the successor to that seat, it's not just that it was held by a conservative justice, one who took this more conservative approach to the judicial role, but that it was Justice Scalia. So the symbolic nature um, of that flip would be significant. So Neil Gorsuch, um, so th these are interviews and speeches that you'll see from various times, various years, uh, within the past five, six, seven years, okay? And you're going to get a an insight into the mind of, for example, yesterday, brilliant man, uh, Clarence Thomas, Justice Thomas, and a very intelligent, you know, brilliant woman in Amy Coney Barrett. The thing is, she worked for uh, Antonin Scalia, who would never in a million years, neither would any of the originalists on the, originalists on the Supreme Court, accuse, imprison a president, a former president, who was commander-in-chief. And you have numerous Supreme Court precedents protecting presidents from indictment. And, and Paul Bartlett, thank you so very, very much. Okay. It's important to get the, yes, the, the videos, some of these videos are older. They're not yesterday. But the reason that's important is because you want to know exactly why there's a victory ahead. In April, early April, we will hear, and I was right about the unanimous Supreme Court decision. I have been telling everyone for years that the Supreme Court would protect Trump because Democrats were acting in a very despotic, authoritarian, totalitarian manner, okay? I told everyone there would be a unanimous Supreme Court decision there was. I said for ye for years, Trump won't spend even a second in prison or jail, not even one second. 
because these indictments are written with absurd, very stupid leaps of logic. The indictments are written as if a a a a, a um as if a uh producer or writer or director at MSNBC wrote them. And here you you it was right here at trial is the Washington Post. Smith quotes need to show needs to show that all the false statements Trump made about, but whether or not they're false, and many of them were not false categorically. He was suspicious, and he had a right to be to be suspicious and to doubt the official outcome, uh, despite very deceptively written. Uh, Lies by omission in the form of fact checks, but let's just continue. We see indictment chronicles and great where were understood by Trump to be false. The special counsel has to convince the Supreme Court that Trump should be imprisoned, and that the they that the that the Constitution will allow a a president to be imprisoned because he actually believe he actually knew what he was saying to be false. Do you understand? It's impossible for the special counsel to prove. And so, therefore, he's already had a huge victory with them looking at it. When they look at the case, when they decide to look at the case, they already gave him essentially partial immunity. So he already has basically partial immunity. He's not going to get six. He's not going to get five, possibly six, because there's six conservatives, but five are more originalist than Roberts. So he's he's not going to get and Amy Coney Barrett is one of them. You just heard uh what she what she was saying about an originalist viewpoint and Scalia. But here it becomes a cause about political speech and First Amendment rights. That's not where the government wants to be. He's protected under the First Amendment. Um he's protected under the, on, 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 in terms of political speech. He's also protected because he actually believed what he was saying. Like millions of the majority of the Republican Party believes what Trump was saying that day. And it was terrible what took place that day. Uh, I condemn it, but I also condemn what took place billions of property, billions of dollars in property damage that summer. Okay, where I don't see any Democrat complaining about that. And I agree with why people peacefully demonstrated. But you had billions in property damage that summer. Not a word from Democrats about how much they care about the Constitution. This is Amy Coney Barrett on originalism. And if just listen to what she says, there's no way she's not going to side with Trump against uh, the special counsel. So he's or this is a huge victory in the making, ladies and gentlemen. Just hit subscribe to this channel. We'll watch it. Just like I told you about the Colorado case. There's a, there's a huge victory in April, a, a monumental victory in April for Trump. And that case is pretty much being dismantled before our very eyes, just like the Georgia case, just like the Florida case. The New York case is hilarious. That'll be overturned either by the state Supreme Court in New York or by the U.S. Supreme Court, maybe the U.S. Supreme Court also. So maybe it's useful to just kind of back up and say, when you define yourself as an originalist, what does that mean? And then how is it going to relate to that distinction between the principles that are timeless, but the applications that are clearly going to change by circumstance? Right. So originalism means that you treat the Constitution as law because it commits these texts to writing. And in interpreting that law, you interpret it in accord with the meaning that people would have understood it to have at the time that it was ratified. And the reason that you do that is because otherwise, well, as I said, the law stays the same until it's lawfully changed. Otherwise, judges would be in the Constitutional Convention business of updating the law rather than allowing the people to take control of that. Now, in the case of the Constitution, as I said, with the Fourth Amendment, Many of its principles are more general. Unreasonable searches and seizures, you know, free speech. Those are things that have to be identified or fleshed out or applied over time. So the fact that there wasn't, you know, the internet or computers or blogs um, in 1791 doesn't mean that the First Amendment's free speech clause couldn't apply to those things now. It enshrines a principle, and we understand the principle as it was at the time, but then it's capable of being applied to new circumstances. 
so when when you um, define yourself as an originalist, what are the other schools of thought that are adjacent to it? And how, how do you think about the debates among those with other people that are now with you on the, the Seventh Circuit, for instance? Sure. Well, Senator Sass, I think one thing that it's worth pointing out is that in the academy, in any event where I've spent a large portion of my career, originalism is not necessarily a conservative idea. There is a whole school of thought, and so originalists are now a very diverse lot. And there is a school of originalism that's more of a progressive originalism and is very committed to uh, keeping the Constitution's meaning, just interpreting text the way all originalists do to say that it was has the meaning that it had at the time that it was ratified, but they tend to read it at a higher level of generality. So all originalists don't necessarily agree. And in fact, there's an advocacy group called the Constitutional Constitution Accountability Center, which has routinely filed briefs in the Supreme Court that calls itself, you know, it, it, it writes briefs in support of originalism, but taking it from a more progressive standpoint. So I don't think it's, I think probably people think oh, it's only who are conservatives who are originalists, but actually it's a more widely accepted view than that. Um, I think that if you think about different strains of approaching constitutional text, originalism is one. All judges and justices take account of history and the original meaning. It's just that some weight it differently, whereas originalists would give it dispositive weight when it's discernible. Other approaches to constitutional interpretation may take a more pragmatic view and say in some instances, well, that may have been the historical meaning, but that's an uncomfortable fit for current circumstances, so we will um, tweak it a little bit to adjust it to fit these circumstances, that situation. Sometimes it's called living constitutionalism, that the Constitution can evolve and change over time. Sometimes it's called like a more pragmatic constitutionalism. So I just I want to make sure we we establish this fact clearly together because one of the things that I think is really unhelpful for the American people when they see hearings like this over the last 20 years is there is an assumption that those of us who've advocated for you over the course of the last three years must be doing it because we know something about your policy views and we've seen the beautiful mind conspiracy. So um, the senator there actually, um, Trump picked Gorsuch, Kavanaugh, and Barrett because they're conservative, okay? Trump did a lot of great things, okay? A lot of great things. Democrats completely um, mishandled their, their primary in 2016. Not only that, I mean, he was a complete and utter catastrophe. It was an, the 2016 Democratic primary was an unmitigated, unparalleled disaster of epic proportions. Then they complained that Trump got three conservative justices. Well, number one, thank God he did. Number two, um, that's entirely the fault of Democrats who, with Bernie Sanders, cheated Bernie Sanders. Okay, they lied. Then they cried about three Supreme Court justices. Well, you did it to yourselves. Thank God, because we now have a Supreme Court that is, 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 isn't an extension of the Democratic Party in the manner that government agencies, uh, law enforcement agencies, intel agencies, um, media, Hollywood, late night comedians. The, the, the Democrats have every single conceivable advantage except the Supreme Court. And they want that too. They want they're gonna eventually want to pack the courts, which is hilarious, because then then Republicans will just add uh you know the appropriate number of justices to um overshadow uh the justices that Democrats, you know, add to the court. The whole thing would be a complete it's complete nonsense. They're not gonna do anything. They're not going to um uh do anything like that. Okay, they just they just whenever they get Whenever they lose political power or influence, they start lying and then, um, you know, mangling norms and traditions. So they care about traditions, but they want to pack the Supreme Court, which is the antithesis of keeping with tradition. But anyway, 
Um, if you look, ladies and gentlemen, they ain't going to allow Trump to be indicted, or I'm sorry, imprisoned, okay? Because if you read the Constitution, Trump is commander-in-chief. He has the right, and, and the, immu- the presidential immunity has been backed up by numerous Supreme Court precedents. He has the right to perform a speech. The speech, he believed what he was saying, which th- just right there, you have dismantled the D.C. special counsel case. Like the Washington Post article says, Trump has to have lied about his, he has to have been intentionally deceptive. The one thing Trump isn't, despite the apoplectic tirades of Democrats, is intentionally deceptive. The most intentionally deceptive people are Democratic politicians. They don't, they really don't believe a lot of the things they claim to believe. Trump does. So he absolutely viewed, just like most of the Republican Party, he absolutely believed that he was being railroaded. Okay, he absolutely believed that. Okay, Smith needs to show that all of the false statements Trump made, again, all of the false statements, what about the true statements Trump made? Most of the Republican Party agrees with Trump. It's the Democratic Party that thinks that he just lied about uh, four years ago. He's never been proven false on anything. The fact check, almost every other, every fact check on what the claims that Trump made are based on a county official or state official that would stand to lose the most if it were found that there was foul play. Zero people testifying under oath Zero um, uh, uh, input from the Federal Bureau of Investigation or investigations. He had no help, and he had to prove, you know, something pretty grandiose within the span of two to three weeks. Of course, the courts were going to go against him, and um, there was zero investigative journalism trying to see if he was right. All the investigative journalism at the major publications, the public relations monstrosity, tried desperately to prove that Trump was wrong. And and when whenever there were journalists or people willing to testify, they were then silenced, disparaged. Saturday Night Live went after a woman in Michigan, I believe. And so, and then from all of this, you get these fact check, these articles checking Trump's facts or his arguments saying, oh, they were debunked. None of, no, nothing he said was debunked. Nothing he said was a- categorically debunked. Some of the things might not have been uh, 100% accurate, but generally what he was saying is that he was, the outcome was derived from uh, a very sloppy, unfair process that, that, that possibly could have been the result of a great deal of corruption. That's all, that's pri- primarily what he was saying. He believed it 100%. He still believes it today. So, the justices, the conservative justices, whether it's 5-4 or 6-3 or maybe even a liberal justice, they're not going to. And Amy Coney Barrett, you heard her talk about Antonin Scalia. You heard her talk about originalism. She's not going to get into Trump's head, his brain, his psyche, and agree with Democrats in D.C. and uh, to say that, well, Trump knew he was lying. Therefore, he no longer was a president with the power to perform a speech uh, and the presidential immunity that comes with performing a speech. And if you read the indictment, it's written, all of these indictments are written by like, imagine just like a democratic operative. They they make really absurd leaps of logic. Um, this is really, really interesting also. This is Trump's, one of Trump's lawyers. Uh, and... He will make a very compelling case against the Supreme uh, with a very compelling case when he speaks to Amy Coney Barrett and Clarence Thomas and the other justices as to why Trump is protected under the Constitution. This will be an unmitigated catastrophe politically for Democrats. If they don't get the D.C. and they won't, they won't get the D.C. conviction. They ain't going to get the Florida conviction. They ain't going to get the Georgia conviction. They might get a conviction in New York, but everyone's going to laugh at that because it's about Stormy, okay? (laughs) 
and the FEC fined Clinton for the DN, for the for the Steele dossier. But listen to this. This is really really important. And so on behalf of President Trump, first of all, this was a momentous day. This is the first time in our nation's history that a sitting president has decided to prosecute his major opponent, who's leading in all the polls in the country. The issues that the court had to deal with today were momentous. Whether or not a president of the United States could be prosecuted for carrying out his responsibilities, doing his job as president. We can't have a country where every four years there's a cycle of political recrimination, where one administration attacks a prior administration, when in fact that candidate is leading in the polls and will be the next president of the United States. As our legal team, as our appellate team made clear, that would be a disaster for our country. That would be a direct attack on democracy, and that cannot happen. Most people. Very significant today, and I'm sure you all caught it, is the special counsel conceded that if it was President Obama, then they'd consider immunity. But when it's not, when it's President Trump, then they're taking the position that there's no immunity for presidential acts that were required when a president is carrying out his job responsibilities. So the DC courts, or no, the, the special counsel stated in lower courts that, that President Obama was covered with all the invasion or the the um, the ousting of leaders in a certain country, Libya, for example, he's covered under presidential immunity. But Trump isn't because of a speech, because Trump knew that he was uh, committing, uh, he was telling lies. W what an absurd vantage point, okay? This is why the current special counsels, Owen Two, John Edwards and Bob McDonnell, had two, two um, investigations, one conviction overturned and lost both cases. And this will be the third uh, case against Trump. They're trying to say that Trump knew he was lying, which is impossible, not only impossible to prove, but 100% the antithesis is the truth. Trump, along with most conservatives, most Republicans, and frankly, most a good part of the country, if not most of the country, thinks that something went on. If you have a, a person who couldn't even uh, form two sentences together, slurs speech, makes up words, um, daughters and stumbles about, uh, and that person is the most popular of all time? Yeah, okay. Something's going on in the minds of a lot of other people. Certainly not my viewpoint. Certainly not my viewpoint. I think that everything, it was 100% fair and wonderful. And yes, and Biden won in the most pristine and fair and wonderful manner possible. And Bernie Sanders definitely wasn't cheated. Yeah. Anyway, um, so the D.C. case is completely unraveling, just like the and by the way, the Georgia case. The fact that one of the prosecutors have to go, that is a victory for Trump. That, that, that's, that case isn't going to be even looked at again until 2025. Trump's going to win in 24. He'll dissolve the special counsel. Um, very likely going to have a difficult time proving anything against Trump or anyone who, who uh, was part of that uh, absurd RICO uh, investigation. And... Like I said, you have the Florida case. So the, Trump was a, a president with the power to declassify. So they have nothing on Trump. They have absolutely nothing on the man. Like they have nothing on Trump. They've just got themselves into this frenzy, this mania, where they think that Trump is going to be imprisoned. And it's like, well, the opposite is true. We, there's a greater likelihood of Democrats than Trump because they actually committed a crime. The D.C. indictment, if you read it, it says that the victims of Trump was the country, the Constitution, and the American citizen. Okay? 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 How absurd. 
a, a leap of logic, such a grandiose, monumental, completely nonsensical leap of logic. The only the only people who suffered, I guess, were the American people when President Mashed Potato Brains took office. So the past four years, the entire planet, and yeah, with inflation and you know countries dissolving, oh, Democrats have and more people losing their lives trying to enter the country than ever before. Oh yeah, great presidency, Biden. But anyway, the, the special counsel said, yes, President Obama is immune from prosecution, but Trump isn't. Why? Because of a speech. And that's the main thing. The, the speech preceded criminal behavior, but it had nothing to do with the criminal behavior. He told people to be peaceful. The reason that had people actually listened to Trump, there wouldn't have been criminal behavior. He said, be, go peacefully. Hit subscribe if you're new, by the way. Huge victory in April for Trump. At least 5-4 could be 6-3. If they get a liberal justice, it will be like the most epic victory of all time. If we adopt what the special counsel wants, if we adopt what President Biden wants, then we open the Pandora's box to political prosecution after political prosecution after political prosecution. In fact, Joe Biden could be prosecuted for trying to stop this man from becoming the next president of the United States. We don't need political prosecutions. We need political process. I'd like to introduce President Trump. Well, I want to thank you all. And we had a, I a very momentous day in terms of what was learned and what they've conceded. They conceded two major points that were uh, they were right in doing it. I don't think they had much of a choice, but they're very, very big, very powerful points. And I think we're doing very well. I think it's very unfair when a opponent, a political opponent, is prosecuted by the DOJ, by Biden's DOJ. Uh, so they're losing in every poll. They're losing in almost every demographic. Uh, numbers came out today that are uh, really very mind-boggling if you happen to be Joe Biden, and I think they feel this is the way they're going to try and win, and that's not the way it goes. That'll be bedlam in the country. It's a very bad thing. It's a very bad precedent. As we said, it's the opening of a Pandora's box, and that's a very, that's a very sad thing that's happened with this whole situation. Uh, when they talk about uh, threat to democracy, that's your real threat to democracy. And I feel that as a president, you have to have immunity. Very simple. And if you don't, as an example, if uh, this case were lost on immunity and I did nothing wrong, absolutely nothing wrong, I'm working for the country and I worked on uh, very hard on voter fraud because we have. Trump did absolutely nothing wrong in terms of um, the speech. He had every right to give his viewpoint on what he was given by his administration. So there were people who gave him information, uh, credible uh, evidence pertaining to allegations of corruption. He had every right under the law to voice his concern. Whether you get liberal a liberal rebuttal from the entire mainstream media, that doesn't mean that his claims were, were, were debunked. They use that dumb, like really ridiculous word, debunked. None of Trump's claims were debunked. Okay, you could say, well, you know, here in this pocket of the country, um, Trump was wrong about what he was saying. But overall, he didn't feel that he was being treated fairly. And there was zero investigative journalism. Like, where was the investigative journalism at the Washington Post or New York Times, MSNBC, CNN? Uh, in favor of Trump. Well, they're not. You're never, you're never going to get that. These are extensions of the Democratic Party. So you have conservatives, Republicans, you have journalists who back Trump 100% and, and can give you exactly why articles that claim to be fact checks uh, were deceptive, lies by omission. Okay? Um there were people who signed affidavits. There were people who witnessed 
very bizarre anomalies. Nobody was investigated. The people who claimed that Trump was lying never testified under oath. And for example, you have the Mueller probe where they accused Trump of being a Kremlin operative. Not only was that categorically false, but you ha you knew it was false in the beginning. There was no evidence at all. It was all a high to moderate confidence assessment by Intel officials who despised Trump. And instead of simply saying there's no evidence, they went on for close to two years in a special counsel with millions of pages of documents, people being indicted, arrested for things that had nothing to do with what they were accusing Trump of. They had people testify under oath. Trump had none of that. Trump didn't have a Mueller probe style investigation um, investigating his claims four years ago. Where was that Mueller probe style investigation? Well, we couldn't have it. It was only three weeks where he went to the courts. The court said, well, where's the absolute categorical proof of evidence? He couldn't produce it. By the way, Democrats never went to the courts pertaining to their allegations that Trump was a Kremlin operative. They, were, they, they <laughs> knew they had nothing, but they then... Uh, accused and indicted and tried to imprison people on process crimes that had nothing to do with the initial allegations. Hit subscribe if you're new to this channel. Almost above all, and we found tremendous voter fraud. We have a list of it. We have some after. Well, nothing has to do with after I left. It was during the time, and that was what they really focused on today during the appeal. And they concede that, and everybody concedes that, and if it's during the time, you have absolute immunity. So uh, we'll see how it all works out. Uh, we have uh, a great argument. We have an argument with they conceded two major points today. In fact, I think it's probably a concession. You have to ask the lawyers, Todd, if you'd like to talk about it. But they conceded two points that I think were, uh, by normal standards, if it weren't me, that would be the end of this case. But sometimes they look at me differently than they look upon others, and that's very bad for our country. Uh, you had a very big event yesterday, as you saw, in Georgia, where the district attorney is totally compromised. The case has to be dropped. Uh, they went after, I guess, 18 or 20 people. They wanted to go after a lot of other people. They wanted to go after senators. She was out of her mind. Now it turns out that that case is totally compromised. In fact, they say she's in far more criminal liability than any of the people she's looking at. So I think that when you look at what happened where they pay a lawyer with absolutely no experience, $700,000, who happens to be her lover or her boyfriend, and uh, then they go on trips and vacations together, very expensive vacations together. And the reason they paid him so much, because he was after me because this way they can afford to pay him a lot more. It probably passes a certain test. And that's a very sad thing that happened in Georgia. And I would imagine that case is going to be dropped. Every legal analyst that I've spoken to, every legal analyst that I've read have said that case is so compromised now it has to be dropped. Uh, very good people were very badly hurt by that case. It's a shame. Very good people. People did nothing wrong. They did nothing different than what Democrats have been doing for years and years and years, whether it's slates or anything else that you're talking about. But they were very hurt, and it turns out that uh, she profited tremendously on that case. It's illegal. What she did is illegal. So we'll let the state handle that. But what a, uh, what a sad situation it is. I want to thank everybody for the fairness. We've been covered very fairly. Most people agree that uh, we're entitled as a president to immunity. If you didn't have immunity, as an example, uh, Joe Biden with the prosecutor, we're not going to give you a billion dollars unless you get rid of the prosecutor that's after, that's after the company or his son or whoever it is they're after. But he wanted that prosecutor gone, and he's on tape saying it. Or you could say the horrible job he's done at the border where our country is being destroyed, or the horrible situation that took place. The lowest moment, I think, in the history of our country was Afghanistan, the way we withdrew, not that we withdrew. If this didn't work out, if I wasn't given immunity, then other presidents, when we talked about today, uh, President Obama with the drone strikes, which were So, 
I'm, I read the indictments, so you don't have to. You can read the indictments if you want. They're accusing Trump of lying, knowing that he lied and deceiving and trying to work with others to defraud the United States and the victims were the American people, the Constitution, uh, and Congress. What? None of this is true. Mashed Potato Brains became president. He didn't obstruct anything, nor did he tell anyone to commit a crime. Doors were opened, which was exculpatory evidence that, that Tucker Carlson um, showed the world that, ju- that the Department of Justice withheld. The Department of Justice withheld all that evidence. And people were acquitted. How deceitful and sinister do you have to be to imprison people knowing that you have exculpatory evidence in the form of video footage that will free these people. And Democrats talk about um, um, prison reform legislation. They're imprisoning people based on deceptively edited videos. They're not showing all the evidence. Trump also stated the word peaceful. He believed everything he was saying, and guess what? Under the Constitution, the rule of law, a president is protected under a speech. Okay? And so, um, he's protected under a speech. And so, there you go. So, you you can't, this is going to be, ladies and gentlemen, tough it out, hello. This is going to be a huge huge victory for Trump. I'm going to, like, there's six conservatives on the Supreme Court. What are the chances? Five originalists. Clarence Thomas, Alito, okay, uh, uh, Gorsuch, Amy Coney Barrett, and Kavanaugh. Kavanaugh, maybe not as much as the others in terms of being an originalist. And so, the media has convinced, tried to convince themselves and the American people that it's beyond a shadow of a doubt Trump committed a crime in D.C., but he didn't. That's the problem. He didn't. He's protected under the Constitution because he has the right to give a viewpoint that uh, fact-checking journalists disagree with or believe that they've debunked. Because in in reality, they haven't debunked anything. Like I said, the a great many Americans side with Trump and believe, just like Bernie Sanders, that he was railroaded. Okay? So, hit subscribe right now if you're new to this channel. I want you to, I want you to listen to Amy Coney Barrett. She, this is the way uh, she will respond to the uh, arguments in August. I mean, I'm sorry, in April. <laughs> in April. Okay. Um, because in April, they'll decide on the immunity officially, but I believe, I'm telling you, they've already decided. They're going to give Trump either partial or full immunity on the speech, which will completely wreck the D.C. case. It will be the biggest, most consequential, most monumental victory in Trump's political life. Because it will prove the Democrats were the despots they claim to be against. And I was right about a whole bunch of things, ladies and gentlemen, in the past couple of years. I'm telling you, this is going to take place because if you read the indictment, the indictment is written as if a Democratic uh, speechwriter wrote the indictment. Democratic Party speechwriter. But listen to Amy Coney Barrett. She's going to ask the same types of questions. She comes uh, within a couple of, uh, about 20 seconds, you'll hear her. Boldly, I think that the question that you have to confront is why a single state should decide who gets to be president of the United States. In other words, you know, this question of whether a former president is disqualified for insurrection uh, to be president again is, you know, just say it, it sounds awfully national to me. Um, So whatever means there are to enforce it would suggest that they have to be 
federal national means. Why does, uh, you know, if you weren't from Colorado and you were from Wisconsin or you were from Michigan, and it really, you know, what the Michigan Secretary of State did is going to make the difference between, you know, whether candidate A is elected or candidate B is elected, I mean, that seems quite extraordinary, doesn't it? No, Your Honor, because ultimately it's this court that's going to decide that question of federal constitutional eligibility and settle the issue for the nation. And, and certainly it's not unusual that questions of national importance come up. Well, I suppose this state. court would be saying something along the lines of that a state has the power to do it. But I guess I was, I was asking you to go a little bit further and saying why should that be the right rule? Why should a single state have the ability to make this determination, not only for their own citizens, but for the rest of the nation. Because Article 2 gives them the power to, to appoint their own electors as they see fit, but if they're going to use a federal constitutional qualification as a ballot access determinant, then it's creating a federal constitutional question that then... By the way, this is the 9-0 Supreme Court decision in favor of Trump. So you hear the Colorado lawyer give his defense of something that's unconstitutional. But Amy Coney Barrett's coming out in a couple of minutes, a couple of seconds. And this court decides, and other courts, other states, if, if this court affirms the decision below, determining that President Trump is ineligible to be president, other states would still have to determine what effect that would have on their own state's law and state procedure. Well, I mean, if we, if we affirmed and we said he was ineligible to be president, yes, maybe some states would say, well, you know, we're going to keep him on the ballot anyway. But I mean, really, it's going to have, as Justice Kagan said, the effect of Colorado deciding. And it's true. I just want to push back a little bit on, well, it's a national thing because this court will decide it. You say that we have to review Colorado's factual record f with clear error as the standard of review. So we would be stuck, the first mover state here, Colorado, we're stuck with that record. And, you know, I, I don't want to get into whether the, the record, I mean, maybe the record is great, but what if the record wasn't? I mean, what if it wasn't a fulsome record? What if, you know, the, the hearsay rules are, you know, one-offs? Or what if this is just made by the Secretary of State without much process at all? How do we review those factual findings? Why should clear error review apply? And doesn't that just kind of buckle back into this point that Justice Kagan was making, you know, that we made with Mr. Mitchell, too, that it just doesn't seem like a state call? Three points, Your Honor. The first is that ordinarily, of course, this court reviews factual findings for clear error, but President Trump made the point in, in his reply brief that sometimes on constitutional questions that require a uniform resolution, this court can do more something more like a Bose Corp style independent review of the factual record. And we would have no objection to that, given that the record here, really the facts that are disputed here are incredibly narrow. The essence of our case is President Trump's own statements that he made in public view for all to see. But then that's saying that in this context, which is very high stakes, if we review the facts, essentially, de novo, you want us all to just watch the video of the ellipse and then make a decision without any deference to or guidance from lower court fact finding? That's unusual. Well, ultimately, President Trump himself urges this court to decide the merits of his eligibility on the factual record here at page two of his brief. He's never at any point in this proceeding suggested there was something else that needed to be in the factual record, any other witnesses that he wanted to call to present his case. And again, the essence of our case is his own statements, and, and, and in particular, his own videotaped statements on He used the word peaceful. Go peaceful. He used the word peaceful. What more can you do as a president if you're using the word peaceful? Okay. Exactly, John. Hello. What more can you do if you use the word peaceful? Go peacefully and patriotically. But here, they are going to give Trump a huge victory. They rolled the dice and they said, well, th maybe the Supreme Court won't even look at it. And the Supreme Court decided to look at it. And I told you the Supreme Court would look at the case, which already means that they've given him immunity. Partial. They could say with partial immunity, ladies and gentlemen, and over 2,000 people watching, hit subscribe. They can 
they gave him a victory by looking at the case. They could easily give him a victory. If they give him a partial victory, it's a monumental achievement. And all they have to do is say, well, he's immune from the consequences of giving the speech. But he's not immune if perhaps he committed a crime uh, working with somebody else, which he didn't. There was nobody that he worked in concert with or, you know, he didn't. They're trying to say that he defrauded the United States, but they can't prove that. They can't prove that. What are they going to what are they going to use? A, a fact an article written in the Washington Post or in, well, I'm using the article written in the Washington Post here, but it's you ha, here it, it explains the special counsel has to prove that Trump knowingly lied, which of course he believed everything he was saying. And most American I would say a great many most Republicans and a great many Americans probably most Americans agree with Trump. Okay. You have somebody who can't even communicate without like slurring speech and making up words. So, but they're not going to say that you could imprison a former president because of a speech given while the person was president. Again, they're not going to allow Democrats to imprison a former president because um, of the notion he lied in a speech. You could do, I mean, Bush almost certainly lied in many speeches pertaining to WMD. President Obama lied numerous times. You could talk about it the, the, regarding the ACA. Or you could talk about Libya. You could talk about a whole bunch of things. Okay. I mean, Biden, you can't, the, the number is endless. Talking about actual major lies. Oh, he didn't work with Hunter's Business Associates. Yes, he did. He met them. He met them. He lied about that. <laughs> we know that categorically he met these people. From the New York Post reporting emails, from witness testimony. And so, um, go. you don't have to do this, but go and ask any liberal Democrat about Trump's lies. They won't give you any like rational um, re, uh, answer. They, they won't, th there's nothing that he lied about that's grandiose. They'll say, oh, he didn't take, you know what, seriously. Neither, initially, Andrew Cuomo and Pelosi basically said it's, it's nothing, nothing to worry about. They've s said that in tweets. Okay, so Democrats were saying the same things as Trump. And anyway, the funny thing is when they say Trump Set, downplay this. If Trump downplays anything, they make it a big deal. If Trump makes something a big deal, they do the opposite and downplay it. They never listen to Trump. So then they say, oh, well, Trump uh, didn't do his job and we would have listened to him. No, you wouldn't have. But anyway, um, ladies and gentlemen, this is absolutely huge. What can I tell you? It's a countdown, ladies and gentlemen, to a celebration. You can go, and when you're bored, go read the indictment in D.C. They can't prove any of it. The, the, the United States Supreme Court is not going to allow any of this to go uh, without the majority of the case being challenged, okay? Meaning that he's going to get presidential immunity, at least for the speech that day. And everything else is based on... Um, Everything else is based on the absurd leaps of logic. The absurd leaps of logic from liberal Democrats who got completely mortified and humiliated by a 9-0 Supreme Court ruling. Anyway, hit subscribe to this, cha this channel, ladies and gentlemen. God bless you. I'll be back tomorrow, uh, likely in the evening. And um, I'm telling you, ladies and gentlemen, love Lawrence Welk. Aztec warrior, I love Lawrence Welk. Um, grew up watching Lawrence Welk with my grandmother. Um, hit subscribe. He's on his way to a huge victory. Amy Coney Barrett will help provide that, as will all the other justices.